Welcome to the Dairy News and Views podcast, a production of the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Dairy Team. Our podcast covers current educational, research, and industry tools available for your operation to manage healthy cows and calves while producing the highest quality dairy products. Well, thanks for joining us today on Dairy News and Views from the ISU Dairy Team. I'm Jen Bentley, Northeast Iowa Dairy Field Specialist, and I'm here with my colleagues today, Fred Hall, Northwest Iowa Dairy Field Specialist, and Gail Carpenter, Assistant Professor and State Dairy Extension Specialist, as we discuss today's timely topic coming up this fall on feeding and harvesting corn silage. So thanks for joining the podcast, Gail and Fred. Great to be here. Always enjoy visiting, Jen. I was out on my way back from Central Iowa yesterday and walked a couple of fields that will be going into uh, silage. And I suspect it's going to maybe be a, an early silage year for us. I would suspect you're out in Northwest, so having a little bit drier conditions out there than maybe some other parts of the state, but it's right around the corner, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, so in today's episode, we wanted to update our audience on some ongoing webinars that our Extension Dairy team is hosting during the month of August. We know with rising feed prices, forages are really that key component of our dairy cow rations, and we want to get the most out of those forages coming into the fall here. So these webinars are really going to help explain how to improve our corn silage efficiency and quality. And Gail and Fred, you are both the host of these webinars. Can you just explain what the webinars are about, how the first one went, and give us a little bit more detail. Yeah, so we, uh, we're we hosting a series of webinars, like you said, it is a timely topic, looking at silage and um, silage processing, silage harvest, and silage feeding, and also just kind of forages in general. You know, with feed prices being so high and with every being, everything just being more expensive right now, having good quality forages is more important than ever when it comes to, to milk production. So we wanted to just kind of do some back, not I don't know, I wouldn't say back to basics, but kind of take a step back and, and have some discussions with some people who are out in industry. You know, we'll have some academics in there. We'll also have some extension people and some industry people and even some dairy producers to come and talk about what they're doing, what they're doing that works well, challenges that they see for this year and other years. So we had a really great discussion this Tuesday with Dr. Bill Mahana from Pioneer and Aaron Mawson from Mawson Dairy. So two just really sharp people with with some great, great experience and great advice and had some really, really interesting discussion about silage processing in particular and some, some best practices there. So it was a really good discussion and we're excited to share it. Well, I think I saw that maybe a little different than what we've done on some of our webinars was this was participatory. Yeah. The discussion made this one because people you know, brought forward their experiences. And yeah, we had uh, Bill there who could really bring some science in, but then the, the down to earth, here's what we find with our chopper. Here's what, when we test as corn's coming into the pile, and this is what we do. So I thought discussion really made this. Yeah, I think we're all getting to kind of you know, especially with this post-COVID world, there's, you can watch webinars. You could have a full-time job just watching the webinars if you want to. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm not, don't get super excited about sitting and listening to somebody lecture me for a half hour, an hour. So a lot of the the discussion and the conversation and just that, that back and forth, I really enjoyed it more than just sitting and, and having somebody lecture me for however long. So Gail, what's coming up next? I, you got three more webinars. So why don't you give our audience those topics? Depending on when you're listening on, on August 9th, uh, that might be next week for you, or it might be in the past for you. Hopefully it's still in the future and you have a chance to join us. But Rebecca Vitito from uh, ISU Extension and Outreach, she's one of our field agronomists, and she's going to be discussing uh, cover crops along with Daniel Olson from Forage Innovation. So bringing in some industry folks and some extension folks on that discussion. And then the next week on August 16th, we'll have Luis Ferretto from the University of Wisconsin. He's also one of their extension folks up there, uh, as well as Ron and Connie Cooper of Connor AgriScience. And they'll be talking about forage storage and, and a little bit more. We got into safety a little bit this past week, uh, but we'll get into it a little bit more detail with them. They really do a lot of great work when it comes to just, just overall safety at, when dealing with silages. And then we're going to wrap it up on August 23rd um, with forage feeding and get more onto that, uh, you know, bunk to cow 
side of things. And we're going to have a couple of dairy producers. So Dave and his son, Ethan Weiss from up in that Decorah area, they're going to be uh, talking about what's working for them on their farm. Uh, and then we're also going to have their nutritionist join us too, Jordan Hunt from GPS Dairy Consulting. So I think that's going to be a really fun one too, to listen to just to kind of get that that interaction with the with the nutritionists and the and the producers there and, and talk about what works for them because I don't know when you last time you've been on that farm Jen but but I'm always impressed every time mm-hmm. I go there with the quality of work that they do with their feed management so yeah I think I it's definitely be, definitely learn yeah. something every time I go to that farm yeah so I'm looking forward to all of these um, I don't want to pick a favorite but that's one that I'm looking forward to I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we switched up a little bit. These aren't the noon hour program. These are in the evening. So you get done with chores, get a bowl of ice cream, sit down at your desk. That starts at 7 p.m. And depending upon the discussion, it's probably close to 8.30 by the time we wind up. Yeah, yeah we, we chose the primetime spot. So TiVo your shows that you normally watch that time of day and... Uh hop on with us instead. Well, it sounds like a really great lineup and I hope people can uh, participate. So within this podcast here today in the show notes, I am going to include the archived webinar that you hosted on August 2nd. So the silage processing webinar with Bill Mahana and Adam Mawson. So people can um, tune into that or if they would like, we are going to pull some of those excerpts from that webinar here on this podcast right now. So you can kind of just tune in and get uh, a lot of those uh, good clips or good discussion of what went on during that webinar. So um, we appreciate Gail and Fred for hosting it and giving us this update. Enjoy the conversation and hopefully you'll uh, sign up for more later on this month. All right. Sounds good. So let's tune in and we look forward to visiting with you on the next Dairy News and Views from ISU. We now join the discussion that Fred and Gail had with Bill Mahana, a global nutritional science manager with Pioneer and dairy producer from Northwest Iowa, Adam Mawson from the Mawson Dairy. One of the things that I have that I like to ask people when we start digging into a topic like this one is what are your red flags and what are your green flags? So when you're looking, Bill, if you're working with producers or Aaron, if you're you know working with your own crew, what are things, what are the big things that kind of strike you like, ah, this, this farm is doing a really good job. I see this green flag here. And what are the things that are kind of like, oh, there might be other issues that we need to address. What are your big red flags? Wow. <laughs> you know, just all of it. Just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think what Aaron had, what Aaron said that, that struck a chord with me was uh, having people assigned to different tasks. I remember being involved with a very large dairy in Minnesota and I went up to help them. I was had a meeting between the growers and the dairy. How do we price this corn silage? And um, on the way up, I called the nutritionist and I said, I'm going to go up there and I'll, I'll check the processing when I go up there. And, he, and the nutritionist, who I know well is a great nutritionist, said, oh, no problem. We have a protocol in place. People are looking at processing. And when I got up there, I went out after a meeting and I took my cup and did a few. And man, I got like 10 or 12 kernels. I thought, wow, this is so I waited for another semi to come in and drop and it did it again. So there was nobody assigned to do that job. So, mm-hmm. I mean, getting that, getting all that ducks in a row in the beginning. And then to the other thing to, that Aaron said was the consistency. And that's one of the big problems is there's not enough pre-planning in terms of hybrid maturities. How many acres can you plant in a day? How many acres can you harvest? What do we do with changing out, swapping out maturity so that we can try to catch all this as much as possible at three quarter milk line. That's a big difference. You balance a diet with a with thirty two percent starch in it and forty percent starch in it. That's a big mm-hmm. big deal. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the neat things that's coming very soon is a lot more of these handheld NIRs on the farm, so that we can actually monitor the amount of starch in corn silage. You know, you know, e- even on a facer. So I mean, I think I think that's going to be the next the next step is to you know really helping us monitor when that consistency isn't there. So those are just some top of mind things. Aaron, anything to add to that? I'd say for me that maybe the most obvious red flags that maybe we forget about is how did last year's corn silage really perform? You know, a lot of times, well, it's in the pile. It's what's there is there. We have to just deal with it. But yet we don't consider that when we're jumping into the next year's harvest and what, what we could do different or 
or try to improve. So watching your, your feed at feed out, you know, it's amazing how you can, the layers of silage in your bunker that you look at when you're defacing and, oh yeah, I remember that layer. That's when we had a two inch rain and we couldn't run for two days. And that's, you know, that, and those, those samples and those, those loads are, are mixed in with it for 365 days. So, you know, pay attention to those, those things that you can learn from the year before and, and try to make improvements every year. Because the only, the only challenge, the only thing I would say to that, Aaron, is there's such a difference in terms of fiber digestibility between one year to the next. Starch, there's not much different. Starch is starch. And after it's, yep. been, ferment, after it's been fermented, there's not, there is no differences between hybrids in terms of starch digestibility. Um, but mm-hmm. fiber digestibility is tremendously influenced by the growing environment. So that's where, when I hear dairymen say, well, it's not feeding is good this year. It must be these darn hybrids. And I'm thinking, well, you might want to blame mother nature for some of that because we know that we know the growing environment's three times more influential on fiber digestibility than, than is the genetics. So that's the only thing to keep in mind when we're comparing one year to the next, but hopefully your nutritionist is, you know, again, that's one of the reasons I think a lot of nutritionists really want to pull the trigger early on corn silage. Cause they want to say, I want the best fiber digestibility I can get. And I can always add starch to the diet if I need to, but I can't add fiber digestibility. But that's why, you know, we really worked hard to say, well, yeah, but when, when corn $7 a bushel, the starches have a lot of value in it. And let's not pull the trigger too early if it's, if it's healthy. I was, I was impressed that you said you, you shoot for that three quarter milk line. Um, that's, that's, that's the sweet spot. In fact, you get to markets like California, they'll actually go out the black layer because their plants are so tall. They got so much moisture coming in from the biomass from tall plants and, and they're a starch deficit state. They got to rail in corn. So they'll actually go out the black layer. And as long as that plant's healthy, which it usually is, they don't, you think California would be loaded with corn diseases, but it's not. Um, and, and they'll can actually harvest quite a bit more mature kernels, so which, Aaron, goes when- to, which goes back to the processing comment. Um, people say, well, can you process immature kernels or mature kernels? And the way Aaron's doing is perfect. You, you look at, you get it set. I don't care if it's two millimeters, one milli, you get it set and you look at it periodically. But custom cutters tell me that they actually feel it's, it's actually easier to process more mature kernels because they tend to shatter going through the roller mill as opposed to a softer kernel embedded with all that biomass that can kind of compress and come out and mm. still the pericarp be intact. So, you know, I mean, there's, but, but again, if we, all the new choppers all have a high differential and, and like Aaron said, that's, that's, the, that's the secret. So Aaron, when you're having those discussions about, okay, what went well, what went bad last year, are you, when do you time that? Do you do, are you talking about that right now? Or is that something that you were doing as a team last fall when it was all fresh in everybody's mind or, or both? I would say both because, you know, we considered some of that prior to planting, mm. you know, selecting varieties and um, which fields we would plant first, you know, which fields will we be, are we going to be chopping for silage, which ones will be delayed for high moisture ear corn. So when that corn is, is ready, depending on what we're going to harvest for, we need to plant according to that. So, and I like to try to use, use some of that variance in, in hybrid maturities to help me with harvest, give me a little bit bigger window. Yeah. 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 But it, it's through the through the year as well as 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 long as well as right now as we consider you know you know do we have the equipment the labor force you know how we know how many hours a day we need to run and to get it done in a in a tight enough window. Yeah, Aaron, you had uh, implied that you've been doing your own cutting for some time. Had you ever worked with a custom harvester? Um, I have done some custom harvesting myself, so okay. but. I, I have not hired a custom harvester for any corn silage. And so the, the question becomes, what are the expectations you want the producer to tell you when you pull your rig in and open up that field? I would say, you know, the biggest one is, you know, a lot of these newer harvesters, they have moisture sensors on them. So you have information immediately as soon as you're pulling into that field. But that information also needs to be verified by sampling at the pile to find out if their if their moisture sensor is calibrated correctly on the machine. Does you know just letting them know that you'll be checking the kernels at the pile and you want to be having a open communication about making those adjustments as as needed and that that 
will happen regularly. So just so that there's that expectation. And as a custom harvester and, you know, doing custom harvesting at times myself, I want to be able to do a, a really good quality job with the harvesting because it's, I know how much it can cost a producer if you don't. So I think just having that conversation with your custom harvester and what that value is to you to have the settings correct and, and doing analysis on, on what's actually coming out of the field. And I think that's, that's key. Any advice from either of you? Um, if we have folks who don't have the uh, custom harvester, who's quite as um, tuned into a dairyman's needs as, as Aaron is, I know in some places in the state, we might not have uh, that same level of service. So is there, and, and not everybody can hold the same standard. So uh, any advice for communicating from, from either of you, you know, communicating expectations with a custom harvester when maybe they don't have quite a, as much of a grasp on that value as the dairyman might? You know, I think part of it is this pre-harvest planning that Aaron talked about. I've been involved with numerous times where we, we sit down and, and we've got the crop manager on the dairy, we've got the custom cutter, we've got the nutritionist, everybody's in the room. So the nutritionist, you know, is really the pulling the lever saying, here's what I want. This is what this is what I need. I think having that custom cutter involved and in, even from planning in the beginning, kind of working them into that inner circle because they're such an integral part if you're hiring a custom cutter. I remember <laughs> I remember having arguments with uh, Dr. Keith Bolson, bless his soul, he passed away now. But I remember having arguments with Keith from K-State. He spoke uh, at the Western States probably 10 years ago, and he and I were on the same program. And <clears throat> when he finished up, he said, uh, I think we're going to see custom cutters dominate the industry. People will all, just all use custom cutters. And as much as I respected Keith, I got up and I said, well, I disagree with you completely, Keith. I think it's going to go the other way. I think it's so important to have control over your harvest that I think more of the big dairies are going to own their own choppers because you've got to take control over it yourself. You just can't wait. And, you know, it's the, the, the worst thing a custom cutter owns is a cell phone because he's always about a job and a half behind, mm. especially if he gets broken down. And, and that's critical. So I think, and that's why I see I, most of the big dairies today. I mean, you get out West, there's, there's still a lot of custom work, but in the Midwest and in the East, I think it's folks like Aaron have gone out and purchased their own choppers. One thing that might be interesting, actually, Aaron, we, we don't spend a lot of time burning down plants anymore if they're healthy. We just look at the kernel milk line because there's such a good range. You guys can pack piles or bunkers very well today, especially you said you're using an inoculant. You know, I think there's quite a range in which those inoculants will, will work as well. I know, I know that to be the fact. We actually are primarily just going out walking fields and breaking years and looking at milk line if the plant's healthy as a target. And I was just out in Pennsylvania last week working with some agronomists and we actually have... Um, the ability now to fly fields with drones and um, and look at, you know, and we can also use, we're working on trying to get satellite imagery, but we can fly fields with drones to look at them. But we can also pretty well by using weather data, calculate for our hybrids anyways, we can calculate with weather data and heat units, we can calculate when that hybrid should hit black layer. Pretty accurately, we can do that, um, especially if we know when pollination occurred. We, if we know planting date, we know pollination, we can really pretty accurately say this is when it's going to hit black layer. So then what we do is we back off 150 GDUs and say, this is when it should be at three-quarter milk line. So not that we're spot on with the actual date that it's going to happen, but what the dairies, especially in the East where I'm from, I grew up in a dairy in upstate New York, we're, we're harvesting lots and lots of small fields. And so we, at least we can sequence the fields at which we will be harvesting or how many fields, you know, how many acres this week will come due and how many acres next week. So I think that's something that's going to increasingly be available to, to growers as well that I think would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we'll get to the point of satellite imagery where we can look at the health of that plant. And, and then if we can determine milk layer, I think it'll save us, save us some, some legwork of burning things down eventually. Well, what are you going to have your interns do then? Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Well, we always got other, other things like yeah. walking fields and looking for tar spot. Let's hope yeah. tar spot <laughs> stays in Wisconsin and not over here in Iowa. Yeah. That brings me to another question that I had. You know, you mentioned for dry plant or for healthy plants, dry matter is not as much of a consideration for you. When is there any time that is it just when a plant is unhealthy that it's useful to measure dry matter before harvest to you, Bill? Or is it are, are there other reasons oh, that you yeah, might want yeah. to be monitoring that? No, I think, yeah, if it's if it's not very healthy, I, I think I think so. 
uh, this drought zoom, zoom that I did yesterday for Eastern Nebraska, people don't realize, for example, in, in stressed crops, or if we have poor pollination or we have drought, it's the grain that dries down the plant. You can take droughted corn and chop it and burn it down in a coaster cooker and put it in your, or put it in a microwave. Or, and it'll be amazing. It'll be 68, 70% moisture because even though the leaves look, you know, dried up and it looks like broomsticks standing in the field, that stalk has a lot of moisture in it. And it's really the starch deposition through kernel development that dries the whole gamish down. So yeah, anytime a plant is stressed, like last year, Gail, at World Dairy Expo, when tar spot really hit southern Wisconsin big time, I mean, tar spot killed those plants in seven days. They were mm. dead. That, that's dangerous. You know, that, that we got to get in there and chop because, again, to Darren's point, we can't, we can't pack it then, you know. So, yeah, if the plant is stressed. So I, I always try to point out it's healthy plants that I'm talking about. But you're right. Dry matters would be important to look at if, if there was something odd going on. And that's really the only time that you care about it? Yep. All right. I don't know if Aaron's that brave. <laughs> We've had this. So last year, I actually had this experience. We, you know, it was a drier summer up here in Northwest Iowa. And we were surprised a little bit because the milk line was at three quarter. And we went out and did some sampling. And oh, my, we have some 68%. You know, the, the plants were were dying down, but the, the kernels were still wet yet. So, so yeah, then, you know, you have, you have to weigh those options and, and look at what your weather is, is going to be like in the next couple of weeks to know what is our window and, and make those adjustments. So I always like to be ahead of the game instead of behind, like yeah. you said, it's, it's not much fun when you're, when you start harvest three days behind. So then you're behind the whole way. So so Aaron, you said you um, you must put a snapper head on your on your chopper, and you're putting up snaplage, or that I call it snaplage earlage. Um, yep. So tell me, I was interested. You said the roller mill when the year the, last year when it was worn out, um, it did it didn't process the kernels on the snaplage the way you wanted it. Is that the problem? No, it just through the season as it continued to wear, and then then in ear corn we we tightened the processor down to about three quarter millimeter. Yeah. Well, because of that wear, maybe certain spots of the rolls were three quarter, but other spots were one and a quarter. So then we couldn't get adequate processing in the ear corn. Processing is even more critical there because yeah, your kernels are drier and yeah. Yep. Yeah. Especially it tends to wear more in the middle where you got more of the feed going through it. Yeah. Yeah. So Aaron, as you're looking ahead to this coming harvest season, what's keeping you up at night? What are you thinking about right now in terms of challenges that are coming up for this year? Well, right now for us, it's it's the heat and and the dry weather here. This this corn is is going to keep being stressed. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're into August here, and we've we've harvested silage as early as the fifteenth of August here on drier years. So, we're we're getting close to that. So we'll keep watching it, and hopefully we have some nice rains in the next few weeks to to extend the health of these plants all the way until the first of September. But I heard a good comment from our agronomist in Nebraska yesterday. There was a question, well, you know, when should I, in droughty corn, when should I go in and take it? And, and Jerome, maybe you can confirm this uh, from your experience, but uh, he said, if you, you know, we know the leaves are going to roll during the heat, he said, but at night, hopefully it'll, it'll unfurl a little bit. But he said, if you get up in the morning, seven o'clock and you walk out in the cornfield and those leaves are still rolled up, he goes, that plant's on its way out. And I thought that was kind of a pretty good thumb roll. But you don't have the drought. You don't have a, your crop looks pretty decent this year, Aaron, right? You're saying? Yeah, we're, right now it's looking, I'd say it looks as good as I've seen anywhere. Yeah, Bill, you're spot on. A lot of times some of those real droughty plants, and Aaron, you mentioned it too, sometimes you think there's going to be very, very little moisture in them. And then you uh, chop some up and run a moisture test and it blows people away. Yeah. How much moisture is in there, but no, Bill, you're spot on. Thanks for the comment. We uh, have some corn over uh, right on the South Dakota state line, sandier soil, upland soil, and we're seeing it probably a, a little farther along and some stress in it that we're not seeing here in the garden spot in Central Sioux <laughs> County. That's good. Bill, what are you seeing for mycotoxin potential for this year? I don't think it's going to be... A big deal. I mean, I think it depends where, where we're talking. Here in Iowa, no, I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. The plants look relatively healthy. Uh, you get into Nebraska where it's really dry. 
I think there could be more of a potential. Frankly, I think mycotoxins are not as big of a deal as what everybody thinks they are. On my team, I have a Dr. Adam Kroll, who's a veterinarian, who's very knowledgeable about it, was ran the microbiology lab at the Iowa State Vet School. And um, we just don't, you know, everybody talks about mycotoxins. When cows aren't milking the way they should, we blame mycotoxins. You know, I, I don't know. It's really a complicated subject. You know, well, it's so tricky, right? Because there's so many of them and yeah. you're, they're hard to test for because you'll yeah. have hot spots and non hot spots. And yeah, there's hard to wrap your arms around. Yeah. I think, I think there's a lot more issues around understanding what the fiber digestibility is and what the kernel processing is and that the starch digestibility changes over time. And all of those things that nutritionists are starting to really pay a lot of attention to, you know, that rumen is pretty evolved. <laughs> And pretty adept at breaking things down. And I just don't see it. You know, I mean, I remember talking to a researcher from Peoria, USDA researcher from Peoria, and they said, you know, a lot of times, you know, you know, all the work on binding agents and all that kind of stuff, a lot of these will be chelated. And then what they'll happen is they will, when they get to the low um, pH of the, of the rumen, they'll, they'll come apart. And then there's, there's a bit of a problem, but I know that a lot of the labs are, you know, really, you know, pushing it. And, and there's companies that really push it that are trying to sell uh, binding agents and, and remediation, but I don't know. Well, we can't I call them know. binders though. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's illegal to, for a nutritionist to do that. Yeah. Yes. I, understand. <laughs> I know the labs test it. When we have samples that we suspect something might be going on, Gail, so that we check every box, you know, we send samples to the Iowa State Vet School and, and get a get our profile done. But many times we just don't see a big problem. The other thing is, just so folks know, no inoculant in the world is going to stop mycotoxins. 90% of any mycotoxin is on the crop before it ever goes in the pit. It's already there and you can't do anything about it. Fermentation isn't going to, isn't going to reduce the level like it does nitrates. They're still going to be there. You know, the point is, you know, good management, packing, keeping air away from it, we're, we're back to the yeast that I said, especially in a stress plant, yeast will eat lactic acid. And when the lactic acid level is raised, then the pH comes up and then nasty organisms can begin to grow. But fungi, mold spores cannot grow without oxygen. So if we're doing a really good job of packing and we're doing a good job of facing, you know, we're keeping oxygen away from that. So the only thing, and, and the other thing is low pH. The only, uh, penicillin will grow down to a pH of about 3.8. So penicillin, if there's oxygen, is something that can grow in silages. But most of the, most of the mold balls in that we may see in silages, none of those are producing a toxin. First of all, they have to, those spores have to go vegetative, they have to grow, then, then they have to produce a toxin. Um, and so, I don't know, you'll, you'll find people that'll completely disagree with me that it's a big, big, big issue, but I think I'd check on what they're selling first before I got to it. <laughs> well, right now, mycotoxins that are there are going to be there. The weather that we have is going to be the weather that we have. Like we're kind of the hybrids that we planted are the hybrids that we planted. So if you're talking to producers right now, um, you know, people that, that watch this, that are here tonight, or that watch this when we post it, what are the things that they should be thinking about and they should be doing in the near future as we're looking to our harvest here in a few weeks? Well, walk the fields, you know, walk the fields, you know, you got to walk the string of cows to know what's going on. You got to walk a cornfield to know what's going on. So I would say, you know, talk to your agronomist or your crop guy or get out and do it yourself. And most dairymen are too busy, got too many things to do. You got to have somebody assigned to, like Aaron said, and try to try to figure out when it's time to go and then get ready to go. Yeah. And that's key, just having that communication ahead of time. And I like, if I can get my nutritionist to come out the first day that we start chopping silage, and you know, if, if we open a few fields, have some different samples to look at, look at it together. And of course you discuss ahead of time what the plan is, but when you're, when you're in there and the first feed's coming in and, and just looking at it and see what can be, can be changed. That's, there's a lot of value there. Yeah. Back to that team approach, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Get the nutritionist out there right away right, right as you're har during harvest. Yeah. That's, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, maybe you mentioned it, but do you, do you have a, a crop consultant on your team of people that you work with. We do. Yep. We've a, we have an agronomist that we work with. We've got a question that came in. 
Are there any management tips for someone who's switching from silage bags to silage piles that you think number one thing they need to consider? Well, don't build it like the Californians. Sorry <laughs> if anybody from California is listening. Build it um, so that you drive over it every which direction. That's really, really important. Now in California, the piles are so big that they can get away with the way they build them out there, but that's not the way in the Midwest or the East that typically we're not putting up that amount of silage. So, you know, so we drive over that every which way. And then I'm just a firm believer in oxygen barrier film, um, especially to protect those tails of the pile. And, you know, it's, it's to me, that's two big important things because you're, you know, we're using mechanical and, and you have the adequate number of pack tractors. You need two pack tractors and one push tractor, at least at a minimum for every self-propelled chopper. That's a minimum. You know, we've been, if you're in a bag, you're using mechanical force to get compaction. Well, when we move to a, a pile, we got to provide it with tractors and make sure, you know, make sure we have adequate pack tractor capacity. Do you have piles or bunkers, Aaron? We have bunkers, some piles that we use for, but not for corn silage. Corn silage is only bunkers. Okay. So yeah, like, like you said, the vapor barrier, you know, now they have great rolls where you can get the vapor barrier already attached to the tarp. So it simplifies putting it on. The other thing with switching from bags to piles, you know, what is your feed out? How much are you taking off that face of that bag per day? And if you go to a pile, depending on the dimensions of your pile, what size is your feed on and will you be taking enough silage off that? each day if you have a larger face uh, that'll be a big big one yeah that's a really good point point. and then the other thing they'll notice probably is more consistent silage because when you go through a bag you're going through you know 12 foot 14 foot whatever you're going through discrete areas whereas with a face you're facing a big bunker especially if we're building it you know the way we build them or a pile we can as we face it we're kind of averaging everything out um, and, and it'd be probably a more consistent corn silage for sure. Yeah. So Bill, you talked about yeast and you, you know, mentioned the importance of an oxygen barrier for yeast and an inoculant, a buchner inoculant for yeast. Anything else? What happens when we're feeding that high yeast corn silage? Well, it's no problem to the cows and, you know, the yeast will produce ethanol, which cows can digest very easily, can digest ethanol. It's just the fact that you set up yourself to have heating that's when Aaron said he tested, looked at his inoculant, uh, not only on the face of the pile, but also in front of the cows. That's really good because that's what you're hoping you're getting. You know, if you've got 20 pounds of dry matter corn silage in a whole TMR and you're using a Buchner inoculant, it'll tend to pretty much keep that whole TMR fresh. It'll stop the yeast growth and, and, and that. And so I know a lot of guys that are as we trend to higher and higher corn silage based diets, you know, the problem is there's a lot of sugar in that corn silage too. And so that's a nutrient source for spoilage organisms to grow on. So if we can keep that pH low in front of the cows, um, which, you know, which a buchner will help to do because it's inhibiting the yeast, it keeps that feed a lot fresher. And to me, that's, that's really important. In fact, I take my thermal sensitive camera and I'll take pictures of the, of the, face of the pile, but I'll also go over and take pictures of the feed bunk too. I don't want that heating in, in there as well. And it, you know, it can save you some money too, because you know, you don't have to really be spending 10 cents a cow a day to put a TMR saver in the into the or some sort of propionic acid product into the TMR uh, you know, during the summer, especially, because usually that corn silage will will hold the rest of the TMR. I don't know if that's been your experience, Aaron, with how fresh it stays in front of cows, but yeah, because your corn silage is your biggest percent of your ration, so that that can make or break yep. your your TMR. I would not be spending money on a buchner inoculant for alfalfa. Um, <laughs> there are there are not very many yeast on alfalfa. It's it's, uh, it's really not worth it. We've talked a lot about the team approach and the, and the importance of the people and the people and the training and, and making sure everybody's on the same page. And we all talk on a couple of these webinars too about the importance of safety, but I think it's worth talking about more than once. Um, so what do you do to ensure the safety of the employees during this, during corn silage harvest? Yeah, so I'll start. So for us, it's, you know, it's planning and just talking about you know, the process. The times when accidents can happen is, you know, it's dark, somebody's backing up to the pile and don't, they don't notice the guy that's 
on the pile pulling the sample or you know just communicating all those different scenarios and so that everybody's aware of of the potential for things to go wrong so you know oftentimes we're we're in equipment so we're we're somewhat protected but there's also safety things for sure you know with equipment with trucks going on and off roads um following rules of the road you know it, obey stop signs don't don't be rolling through them all at at 20 mile per hour you know pay attention to take your time when you're going in and out of driveways uh when you're backing up uh you know just just a lot of those things w that can potentially cause an accident so and you know as we've when we've done it over the years we've we've all experienced those hopefully not um accidents but close calls or you know things where that, that we want to be paying attention to Another thought I had with safety is after it's in the pile, but when we <clears throat> go up on these large piles and we're pulling the plastic back, um, that's kind of a kind of a dangerous thing to do. Sometimes they can avalanche down, and the uh, I uh, there's a dairy in Wisconsin that I learned this. They were building a new freestyle barn, and the guys working on the Raptors had all these har harnesses on, so mm -hmm. if they fall, it catches them. And that's what they've started to have their employee put the harness on and then it's a, to a cable back to a post, you know, they stick it in the, in the, the pile and then, you know, they'll take that over when they move it back. But it, it saved two of their people falling off, falling off about a 30 foot face from hitting the ground. It caught them. So I think, you know, watching that, being careful when we're pulling plastic back is really important as well. By the way, Aaron, I, um, before you got on, uh, Gail and Fred uh, told me that they were coming out to help you cover your piles this year as kind of reserved uh, for you being on the, for Yeah, you being we didn't talk about what Aaron was going to pay us. <laughs> so you'll have some extra help covering that pile. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Bill. We yeah, you're welcome. Your job security for me. <laughs> yeah, um, Aaron brings up a good point about the oxygen barrier film. So there's two types now. You can put, you can buy oxygen barrier film and then use normal six mil plastic. Or you can, um, number of companies, I know Raven Industries is one of them that has a product that it's embedded into the, into the plastic. Uh, it's all in one, which is a lot easier when you're trying to cover a pile. W one thing to be careful of though, if you do that one step approach is that you really have either pea gravel bags or tires all along the front face so that we don't get any air going underneath that and, and billowing into the silage mass. That is one advantage to this two-step approach because, you know, if you get air underneath that six mil plastic, still that oxygen barrier film is going to be protective. But it's really important to have a, a and I like pea gravel bags rather than tires on the front, but, and I'm not a big believer that you need tire to tire to tire to tire on a pile either. You know, just making sure that front face is really protected so that we don't get air moving underneath there. You know, it's a typical academic speaking, Aaron, you know, that doesn't have to go out and put that silence, the thin plastic down when the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour. That's not a fun job, I know. Yep. That's why that one step has been quite popular. Yeah, for sure. So we're rounding out now at a little more than an hour. Um, and I have kind of a different question for you guys. Uh, what is the smallest hill you'll die on? Like, What's the thing that seems very minute when you're, when you're thinking about all the problems that you'll have, but is kind of a make or break? Like the thing that a lot of people tend to forget, but is really something that, that just kind of makes the whole thing work that often gets overlooked. Well, I think it's a processing back to what this was about. I think a lot of times people aren't taking the time and effort that Aaron is doing to check. You know, I, I on our cup, we say check every third load, um, you know, but, uh, you know, people just don't don't check it. And then like that dairy in Minnesota that, you know, everybody thought somebody else was doing it. And so imagine what that's going to do to cows in terms of consistency mm. when you go into that portion of that bunker where, and, and the custom cutter, I went out and talked to him. He goes, oh, I was in a really immature field last night. I opened up the roller mill and I didn't close it down. I mean, he, he wanted to do a great job. He just kind of forgot to close it down, you know, if somebody was paying attention. So to me, I don't know if it's a small hill, but, you know, we worry about moisture. We worry about maturity. We worry about pack tractor capacity. We worry about all that stuff. That, that kernel processing is really, really important because if that pericarp, if that pericarp is still intact, the starch digestibility is not going to change and it's going to be low. And unless that cow bites that kernel with her teeth and it moves down, and, and I think I, I think to me, that's the hill I would talk about. Aaron? I think I'm going to agree with that. You know, it only takes two minutes, maybe max, to get out of the machine and adjust the processor. So 
think most custom guys are going to, they're willing to do that, but they need to have the information because if, if he's in the machine, he has no idea what's coming out of the truck on the pile. And sometimes it can surprise you. You know, you might, you might have your settings where you would have it on almost every field and you get into a certain field or variety and right. it's not adequate. So, yeah, uh, if, if we have time, I'll share a little story about, uh, I, I think, you know, hemorrhagic bowel syndrome, we call it a syndrome because we don't know what causes it. But I think the reason we're not seeing that today, like we saw it 10 years ago. And, you know, we're, you know, it's your best cow, your biggest eater, your best doer. She, she goes down with a bloody gut and she's dead overnight. And I've been involved in enough situations where people, it was a large dairy in Kansas I worked with probably 10 years ago. The nutritionist asked me to go down and look at it. And they'd had a bunch of people down there, veterinarians, and I got showed up at the dairy and the dairyman said, you want to walk the cows? And I said, no, I'm, I don't need to walk the cows. And he goes, well, what do you hear? What do you want to look at? I go, take me out to your corn silage pile. And they were losing like 15 cows a day, the hemorrhagic bowel syndrome. And so I went out to the corn silage pile with my cup and I did it and I pulled out about 10 kernels. I go, there's your problem right there. And I think the reason that go, we see bouts of it, you know, in, in some big dairies is I said, how many choppers did you have working to fill this huge pile? He goes, well, those three choppers. I go, were you checking the kernel processing on the three? No, no, we didn't ever check that at all. I go, well, that's where we go into these situations where we'll get into a you know, maybe two of the choppers were set up right, or like Aaron said, you get into a different field, a different hybrid. You know, they all process just a little bit differently, uh, depending on the maturity of the kernel. And, and uh, so, anyways, I said, you know, that's that's the issue. And then, then that undigested starch gets down to the hind gut, and all of a sudden, Clostridia or Aspergillus, whatever's causing the problem, start to grow, produce toxins, and we get this bloody gut. But we don't see that as much today, I think, because the whole industry and and the way choppers are designed today. We're just doing such a better, better job. If you look at the data from uh, Cumberland Valley and Rock River and, and Dairyland Labs, and, and you look at the data for their corn silage processing scores, man, it used to be like half of the samples that came in had below a 50 for a kernel processing score. Now it's all skewed to the right. I mean, everybody's doing a fantastic job today. And, and I think that for that reason, we don't see as much hemorrhagic bowel syndrome as what we used to. It's a good note to kind of start wrapping up on. You know, it's corn silage harvest. When you look at 365 days in the year, it's really a small percentage of all of those. But we're feeding corn silage all year. You know, just like you said, Aaron, it's the biggest part of your TMR. So I think really great discussion points we've had tonight, just in terms of being having that detail orientation kind of taking. I know it's an exhausting few days but making sure that we're being as detail oriented and as conscientious as possible during that time, because it's what's going to pay off for the rest of the year for our cows. Anything else to, any other questions, Fred? No, I, I think you kind of closed up the program. I'd mention again, and you know, I, I'm the guy who always talks about safety, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's somebody tired, somebody's dehydrated, somebody's hungry, running that truck back and forth, four in the morning those are things that can cause huge problems yeah. so being safe uh, not just around the pile but with the equipment uh, my dad was the greatest we had a new holland two-row chopper and that old bird had every safety panel off of that <laughs> so we could get to the problems faster yeah. they're there for a reason yeah. and you know i I want to see as we move into the silage harvest that folks in my part of the world and across the country are being safe and I don't read about any disasters. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or combination inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu backslash diversity backslash ext.